We're going into week two of the NFL season, and week one is all about overreaction. So you're going to hear a lot of talk shows just overreacting to everything we saw because we've only got one game on these teams. That said, there is something to the overreactions. Like, sometimes we're right about these teams. Other times we're wildly wrong because it's just one game. Like, there's one game. There are a lot of quarterbacks this week that played really bad. There are a lot of teams that I think didn't have their best on Sunday and Monday, and that's okay because they've got a whole season to kind of figure it out. What we want to do today, though, instead of overreact, we want to go through five teams that we're most worried about going into week two. And this is season-long worries. Maybe this is immediate future worries with some of these teams. They're kind of different scales of it. I also think that we should kind of give a worry rating on these two where – some of the teams we talk about, we are worried about them, but maybe not as much as the other ones. So we'll kind of come with a number just to kind of quantify the value of how worried we are. And it's not just a whole kind of we're really worried about these guys. So we have our list of five. Let's start with the Buffalo Bills. I don't think there's any other place to start after Monday night. Josh Allen, he's the turnover king now. And it's not just a one game problem like this is going back to last season where since week one of 2022 he's got 38 fumbles and interceptions and that's not fumbles lost but he's fumbled and been intercepted 38 times which is over two per game of turnover worthy plays they lost to zach wilson how worried are we about the buffalo bills because i think bills mafia is probably pretty worried if you notice from our last podcast, there's a member of Bill's Mafia that's, that's not sitting here today. And I think that might be a weird coincidence, maybe. but maybe it's because he didn't want to show his face because he's the Josh Allen hype, hype train king. And Josh Allen was, if I'm ranking quarterbacks after week one, he might be in the 32 spot because that was not pretty. And yes, it's, it's, it's one week. Um, but these are long stemming issues with the Buffalo Bills. You mentioned the, the number 38. If you even go back to 2021, and this is strictly turnovers, not just you know um, fumbles, but not fumbles lost. He does lead the NFL in turnovers since 2021 with 41, That's which is lot. staggering. And it, it, it just, to me, the whole problem with the Bills is that they consistently ask Josh Allen to just do way too much. Um James Cook, we, we heard of all this hype with him over the offseason. He had just 12 carries. He looked good, too. Yeah, he, looked good. he did look good. It looked good. like he gave him a burst. Yeah. Josh Allen dropped back and threw the ball 41 times in a low-scoring game. It, it, it feels like the Bills' offense has no script, no structure. Um, make things easier for your quarterback. So many times he looks lost. He's trying to extend plays. He's trying to show off his big arm, and it just leads to a whole lot of nothing. Not a pretty showing in week one from these Buffalo Bills. It's also a matter of just like understanding the situation. When you're up 13 to 6 against the Jets, it's like, why are we taking deep shots downfield when we should just be trying to finish this game? Like you said, give it to James Cook. Let him run when you're trying to shut out the Jets and put them in the, the coffin. Instead, you see Josh Allen just loading up with pressure in his face, whatever, staring down Gabe Davis. Uh, like, all these interceptions are so avoidable. And I mean, you talk about going back to 2021, this is just who Josh Allen is now. Like, people are saying he's gotten better at taking care of the football. It's clearly not the case. And he's played in, like, 78 games. In 19 of them, he's thrown for two or more interceptions. And you look at Patrick Mahomes, and I know he's not Patrick Mahomes, but No, but that's the guy that, that everyone compares yeah. him to. Exactly. exactly. So on the opposite side with Mahomes, 81 games, nine in games with two-plus interceptions. It's half. And that's who you have to be if we're talking about the Chiefs and the Bills as two contenders in the AFC. And I think when you look at the best quarterbacks in the NFL and we saw it with Mahomes I think last year and even Joe Burrow where teams were playing different types of defenses to account for the fact that they love to throw the ball deep and so you're playing a little more too high and just being like okay we're, we're not going to let you beat us deep like you are going to have to throw five to ten yards all game long if you want to beat us. Josh Allen seems like the only guy out of those elite quarterbacks that just hasn't adjusted to that in the sense that, like, he is still like, no, we are going to take shots. I am going to just force everything. I'm going to throw it deep. I don't care what the defense is giving me. Like, checkdowns, no checkdowns. But it helps if you actually do that more because then the defense comes up and it's like, oh, crap. Like, he's just going to take what we're giving him all game. Like, we got to do something to stop him. So you mentioned, like, the, the game script. The Jets have a really good defense. Yeah. You're going to throw it 41 times against them, and they're without Aaron Rodgers? Like, you can control this game yeah. if you want to, and you're like, no, we're going to throw it 41 times? 
Ble- mind blowing. Like bleed the clock. Yeah. Especially like you're on the road. You know it's going to be a low scoring game. Take control. Be in the driver's seat. And it's it's it comes down to the fact that it feels like hero ball for the Bills every single week. And it worked at first when Josh Allen was new and fun, and he was running over defenders, and he was showing off his big arm. But it feels like. A defense doesn't have to game plan against the Buffalo Bills. They have to game plan just against Josh Allen, where if you look at the best teams in the NFL, you got to worry about everything in their offense. And you're in a chess match against their head coach. And with the Bills, it just feels like you know exactly what you're getting. As long as you can limit these big Josh Allen plays, you're going to frustrate him. You're going to limit what they can do in terms of on the ground and in the air. And and you're going to beat them. And there's a reason Whitehead had three picks. Like, he clearly has something on Josh Allen. He has a read on what he's doing. Whenever one player has three interceptions, he's he's reading the quarterback. The quarterback is giving him a clear read that he's going to throw to a certain spot. Let's just play some more ball control. He doesn't have to be a manager, we know that. But just limit that gunsling mentality a little bit. So now the question is, how worried are we? Because... They're not facing the New York Jets every every game, and the Jets have a really good defense, as we alluded to. So they're going to beat up on a lot of teams. They're going to pick off a lot of teams. They are going to have their way with some really good offenses and slow them down all year long. The Bills' defense looked good, and they're going to get Vaughn Miller back at some point, but Leonard Floyd adding him looked good. Like they, they didn't give up much. Again, I know they're playing against Zach Wilson, but how worried are we that they are not a legit Super Bowl contender? <sighs> I, I'm going to say about a 6 on a, on a scale of 1 to 10. Um, it is a long season. Yeah. I do think we will see the best of Josh Allen at spurts. But it's just about in these close-knit, tight games where the defense is making it very tough on him. Can he limit all the mistakes? And that is something I still need to see. So that's why I'm going to go as high as a 6. But I don't want to push the panic button yeah. too much. Making the playoffs is not good enough for the Buffalo Bills right now when you have that loaded of a roster, when you've been in this supposed Super Bowl window for about you know two, three years now. The AFC is very, very tough. Um, you don't have room for much error, especially because in January, you want to be playing at home against the Chiefs. You don't want to be going on the road. Um, and if they don't win their division, they're not going to be playing at home at all in the playoffs. Yeah. So that's why I'm going to go to about a six because I, I think they just need to not necessarily clean up Josh Allen, but just diversify their portfolio and, and ask him to do a little less. I'm going to dial it back, I think, a little bit. I know where you're coming from, but I think I just go with a three. Okay. I think I keep it pretty low. Again, we're only talking about Josh Allen here. Like, the only worry about all of us, is really Josh Allen for the Bills. And going back to previous seasons, it's like that's the strength of the team. I'm not saying we're writing him off, but to make them a concern about winning the Super Bowl after one game against possibly the best defense in the NFL with a defensive line that's, that put so much pressure on him in week one, um, I'm going to dial it back. I think the Bills are still up there in the AFC, and it's just Josh Allen having a bad game, which is becoming concerning that it's happening so often now. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to go in between you guys. I'll, I'll go a 4.5 maybe just to, <laughs> to make it right in between you guys. 1.5 up, 1.5 down. And I think for, for all the reasons you kind of outlined, just the worry more is that how many of these games are you going to throw away throughout a season? Like that was, that was a win. That's a mm-hmm. big divisional win that could bite you like you said, when it's all said and done and you're looking at standings and you want a home playoff game, remember week one against the Jets when Zach Wilson played the entire game and you gave it away. I'm not really concerned about the defense. Like, no. I think the defense is fine, but you have the offense to score. It's Is that offense going to be consistent enough in the turnover department that you can actually win these games instead of just giving them away and keeping teams in it? Like, Las Vegas... Should be an easy win by all accounts. At home, home opener. I don't know. Like, if you're tossing three picks, you're probably not going to win the game. So there's a lot to clean up in Buffalo, but we're not worried just yet about them. Let's let's see a couple more games. Let's move on to the New York Jets. Same division, and I think the worry here really is without Aaron Rodgers. Like, is this team going to make the playoffs? I know. Uh, Robert Sala said yesterday, like, everyone's kind of writing us off. Like, why are you doing that? I, I think the answer is pretty obvious. No one trusts Zach Wilson. So how worried are we about the New York Jets of, I think now the question is making the playoffs. I don't think it's challenging for a division with Zach Wilson. 
It's crazy how now with limited expectations or almost no expectations with Zach Wilson yeah. coming in, the way I view this team is almost flipped on a 180 in my head because with Aaron Rodgers and all the hype that they were getting, I was kind of like, they're overrated. They're going to come up short. Don't buy in. It's a tough division, and I think they're going to be falling behind. Now Aaron Rodgers goes down. Obviously, the whole Super Bowl, like we can we can kiss that dream goodbye. But I'm starting to view the Jets as like this sneaky underdog because I think people are underrating how good they're going to be w- still with Zach Wilson. Um, because if, if we look at what they did last year, they didn't ask him to do a whole lot. He couldn't do it. But if he can just do a little bit more, just a little bit more. And like, this is a young quarterback. Yeah. He's had an off season with Aaron Rodgers. A- am I wrong in saying that he's going to improve a little bit? Like, am I being a little too optimistic? I and, and, and I view them as this like sneaky beat where teams are going to look at them and say like, okay, yeah, we're, we're playing the Jets. It's Zach Wilson. This is a game we need to win. And they're going to have a really tough time. But obviously with the expectation, like the fact that Aaron Rodgers is gone is a massive, massive concern. So I kind of view it as like a tough one to grade in terms of how worried I am. Zach Wilson, what does he have to do to actually win games with the Jets? Put up 20 points? 20, like 23 points? The baseline, yeah. You don't need much, honestly. I mean, they just beat the Bills when they, you know, scored an OTU on a punt return touchdown. Like this team is built to win in other ways than just on offense, which is why when Rodgers joined the team, it's like, that Brady thing where Tampa already has this great defense. The, everything is built around it, and they're just missing the quarterback. So now the Jets go back to just missing a quarterback. But like you said, Aaron Rodgers is still in the corner. And for me, it's like Brees Hall looked amazing in week one in limited touches. Dalvin Cook is there. Um, Garrett Wilson is still developing in year two. Like It's not just Zach Wilson making plays now with limited weapons and, and everything, and then the defense to support him to give him some favorable field position. Like I think the Jets are still a playoff team. Um, in that like seven spot, obviously. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, but it's just gonna be ugly. I guess the worry scale is tough with this team because I think we're all worried about their Super Bowl chances. Yeah. For sure. Like that, it's ten out of ten if you're if exactly you're talking Super Bowl. But like you said, the expectations have drastically changed now, and so Zach Wilson doesn't have to do a lot for them to kind of sneak up on some teams and get some wins, as we saw on Monday night. I think. The thing that worries me most with them might be a little bit of a defensive regression. And I'm not saying that Sauce Gardner's overrated, but I kind of am saying that Sauce Gardner's overrated because we saw what Stephon Diggs did to him in week one. And I just think that regression is natural, especially on defense where it's kind of tough to be a top three unit year after year after year. So my worry with the defense is a little more so based out of that claim and i guess overall worry of them making the playoffs is a little raised because of that but the expectations aren't playoffs now yeah the hardest thing to replicate on the defense side of the ball is turnovers yeah and they give the team and the offense such a boost if you're putting your offense in favorable field positioning you're going to score points and the fact that you don't know if they're able to rep like they can be a great defense but turnover numbers are, are tough And I'm glad you said that thing about Sauce Gardner. He's a great player. But listen, I will die on this hill. If this guy's name was Steven, nobody would hype him up. (laughs) Like, he's getting consistently hyped up as this, you know, generational talent. We'll see. Sophomore slump. He didn't have the greatest game Monday Night Football against the Bills. So if I'm going to put a number on it, like you said, it's a 10 out of 10 if you're talking about the original goal of the season. But... If I'm, you know, banking them to make the playoffs, I'll put the worry at like maybe a five. Yeah, I think five is where I'm thinking for playoffs too, yeah. just yeah. because of all the all the uncertainty now with how how that offense is going to function with Zach Wilson again, and maybe not uncertainty. That may not be the right word because we saw it last year a little bit, but uncertainty in the sense that like. I don't know. This guy was a top three pick. Can he find something? Maybe that's it's uncertain. But if he does find something and taps into something, then the Jets have something. Yeah. Like this could be a pretty magical season. He's got the tools, admittedly, but I I don't think anyone's making the bet that Zach Wilson is going to turn this thing around. No, I have the same worry numbers as you guys with a 10 for Super Bowl and a five for just playoffs. But for me, you've seen in the NFL defensive fronts can can carry teams along with including into the playoffs, and win a couple games there. And to me, that's what the Jets are all about. That defensive front is absolutely nasty, and I think that alone is enough to kind of take them into the AFC playoff picture. It sucks that we're not going to see a full season of Aaron Rodgers, and we'll have to, yep. hopefully, if he decides to play again, 
uh, wait till next season because I think everyone is just really excited about what this roster can be with him at the helm. A roster we probably aren't as excited about, the New York Giants. Let's stick in New York. They got destroyed by the Dallas Cowboys. It was one of the worst losses I've ever seen. They could not do anything. There was not a positive about that game, so this is probably the team that people are going to overreact to most. When we did our predictions video, none of us had the Giants in the playoffs. None of us even talked about the Giants (laughs) making the playoffs, sniffing the playoffs. I don't think any of us are Daniel Jones fans, especially of that contract that he got and being the kind of face of the franchise for the next few years. They can definitely get out of it at some point, but that was a big decision to commit to him long term and doing so after a season where he threw 15 touchdown passes and ran a lot, which you knew was going to be dialed back because you want to kind of keep him healthy after investing so much money in him. So I know it's one loss, and this is kind of what we're talking about with all of these teams, but how worried are we about the New York Giants? The problem for the Giants is that, like you said, there was literally zero bright spots. There's nothing you can go to and be like, oh, okay, at least we did this well today. Nothing. And the only thing for me that kind of, I know Daniel Jones is going to get a lot of heat from us, as deservedly so, but, I mean, that game was out of hand so fast. Like, the Giants had to go away from their game script almost immediately. He had them moving the football early in that first quarter, and then there was a botch snap, and then there was a blocked field goal for a touchdown, and then the Saquon Barkley fumble for a touchdown. It's like, okay, so Daniel Jones had his team in position to actually go ahead early, all of a sudden, that completely changes, and it's just unfair to put it all on him because from then on, it's like, okay, Daniel Jones, you have to throw us back into this football game because we're behind so early. Uh, the Cowboys know that, and they just pin their ears back and start attacking. So it's like, it's such a tough spot to be like putting it all on Daniel Jones, and the biggest issue for me is just the lack of fight across the board from this team, and like there was just nothing coming back. Yeah, I, I don't want to put it all on Daniel Jones because... He 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 was in a, in a very tough spot Sunday night. Um, I think his weapons group is horrible. Yes, um, that that is 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 very tough for a quarterback when you don't have great weapons, especially in a league where look at every quarterback who succeeded on Sunday. They have star receivers everywhere at their disposal. The thing I really like that you said is Daniel Jones put them in a position to take the lead. They didn't. They went down from the block field goal, yeah. and then they asked him to throw their way, throw his way back into the lead. Since 2019, when the New York Giants have allowed just 25 points, this is in the Daniel Jones era, they have a record of 2 and 30. Oh, my crap. This is a team that can't play from behind. Yeah. And Daniel Jones, yeah, he got this big contract. Um, I understand how the market works, where as soon as a guy shows you he can take you to the playoffs, that's the going rate for a quarterback. But he is no means worth $40 million. Um, This is a guy that needs phenomenal talent around him, a very favorable game script, and a defense that's going to keep it close. And you probably want to have Daniel Jones when you're playing with a lead. You're not going to win shootouts with him. And I know the NFC is a little weaker, but it's an offensive league right now. It's very pass-heavy. And that's why like, I have massive concerns about the Giants because I think their season last year is going to be very, very tough to replicate. I think so, too. And I think with that division getting better, too, like we knew the Cowboys and Eagles were going to be great going in. But Washington is a better team this year than they were last year. And when I look at that NFC East, like you need to win some games within that division to replicate going back to the playoffs. I will say, too, part of what the appeal is with Daniel Jones is obviously the running. And so that dual threat of passing running but him and Saquon working together like that's the game script you're talking about where it's like you're bleeding the clock down with these long drives whether it's Jones running Saquon Barkley running you're keeping defenses on their toes a little bit with that kind of um, offensive game plan it, it's tough because it's like how much do you want him running there this is the question with any quarterback that you sign to a long-term deal like Lamar is going to get the same question about how the offense is centered around him how you want to obviously keep him upright and keep him healthy and keep him taking less hits than he would have been in earlier years where it was like that was his superpower and that still is his superpower and he still is really good at it but you want to do it with more emphasis and force and um, intent when you're running with Daniel Jones and not have him just kind of breaking down and running for the sake of running and taking extra shots for the sake of taking extra shots it's so tough and I mean even in this game like afterwards Michael Parsons came out and was like 
fight they leave him in to just yeah. continuously get killed by the Cowboys yeah. defensive line. Uh, it, it's such a weird scenario, and it's also odd when Parsons from the other team is coming out and being like, you know, Jones is actually a decent player, but he does need help. I don't think any of us are going to deny the fact that like this receiving corp, like you said, is horrendous. I know they got Darren Waller, but the tight end position can only do so much unless your name is Travis Kelsey. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just has no one to throw to. In that situation, in that game, I'm not sure many quarterbacks would stand much of a chance in that spot. I agree. And I, I think the the criticism is earned, though, because of the contract. And yes. so whether yeah. Daniel Jones and the Giants like it or not, they're going to be judged on that contract that they gave him because that money says to everyone in the world that he is our guy and we can win a Super Bowl with him in the next three or four years. What happens after that, if you give him another deal, is obviously another question that uh, I'm sure will be up for discussion. And it might look very bad, this contract, by the end of this season. But that's what that money says. So whether we sit here and say, hey, he needs better weapons or not, like when you're getting paid that much money, you're expected to prop up those weapons and kind of win in spite of them sometimes and do better in spite of them, which I think everyone watching Daniel Jones knows that that might not be the case. Yeah, and I think that is a little unfortunate because at the end of the day, he's going to be the one who's ridiculed and exactly. labeled as a waste of money and this expensive signing that didn't work out if things continue on the trajectory that I think we all believe is going to happen. And that's just what happens when your number one wide receiver is you know, I- Isaiah Hodgins and Darius. you're relying on, on Darren Waller to potentially carry a workload that maybe he was more suited to do so three, four years ago. Um, like I said, I, I'm such a believer in coaching and surrounding your quarterback with everything he needs to succeed and then watching him flourish. And I think Daniel Jones has some of the skill sets to be very effective in the right system. His ability to use his legs is great. Um, I do think he has some limitations as a passer, but if you scheme up an offense where you got a ton of speedy guys getting open, like he's he's going to do well. Um, and the Giants just just don't have that. So I think that the $40 million price tag is could look pretty rough. And the worry for me is probably like an eight. Yeah, I was going to go nine. Yeah, yeah, eight or nine. And yeah. it's, it's again, not worry personally because I'm just like, I, I didn't have expectations for this mm-hmm. Giants team. We all didn't pick them to make the playoffs for all of the reasons we have outlined. And when you look at the defense too, I just don't think there are enough impact players that can change the course of a game on defense. I, I like a lot of their guys. Yeah. I think they're a solid unit, but I just don't think they have a guy like if we're going to talk about the Steelers, for instance, like a, a reason why we wouldn't be worried about the Pittsburgh Steelers is because on defense, they have Minka Fitzpatrick and they have TJ Watt, two of the best players at their positions in the NFL that can change games with singular plays. Yeah. I don't think the Giants have that on defense to help the offense a little in these situations. So if you thought the Giants were a playoff team coming in, I think the worry's got to be at least an eight. And it's like you said, they can easily go, what, one in five in division? I mean, what sense of confidence could you have at this point to say, like, they're going to go into Philly and beat the Eagles, or even beat them at home, or and now they got to go to Dallas. I think <laughs> last time Dallas. it was there, it was like 40 to three or something like Zero that. Zero like, confidence. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I'm at a nine for mm, nine and a half. All right, we've got two more teams that we're worried about on our list. They are both in the NFC, and they were both kind of, thought to be playoff contenders they both made the playoffs last year starting the nfc north with the minnesota vikings this team was the prime candidate for the biggest regression of all time after winning all of those one score games having these insane comebacks week after week and the vikings lost to baker mayfield and the tampa bay buccaneers in week one justin jefferson had a buck 50 basically at half and then had two catches in the second half there is a lot of concern with this team i think for a lot of different reasons For starters, Kirk Cousins is still Kirk Cousins. Like, I think he is just a little better than Daniel Jones. He can win you more games than Daniel Jones can, but he is never going to be that guy that is going to consistently carry you to wins. But then you look at how they kind of approach this offseason. They let some veterans go on defense. They got younger on defense, which to me is always a sign of, okay, we're we're kind of just going to see what we have with our draft picks because we need to, and we need to see if any of these guys are contributors. But it's also a sign of we've got one foot in a rebuild and one foot in a playoff scenario where we think our offense is good enough to carry us, but our defense is going to be just up and down all season long. 
What is your concern with the Minnesota Vikings? I, I really don't even know where to start with this team because they are just all over the place, and they've also got a Justin Jefferson contract extension looming. If they have a bad season, like could that just be the thing that pushes him out of Minnesota? Saw the body language on the bench after the game. Like there are not good vibes coming out of Minnesota. Pox ready. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. go for it. I, I think I want to challenge you a little bit. Okay. And give you some pushback on on the Kirk pushback. Cousins slander. Um, first half, I think he had 271 passing yards. Justin Jefferson, like you said, close to a buck fifty. Second half, Justin Jefferson had two catches. I think the Vikings had 71 total yards in the air. That is not good. No. Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say like, oh, Kirk Cousins did everything he needed to do to win the game. Um, there were some very, very unfortunate turnovers, some bad decisions, some some fumbles, just sloppy, sloppy football in the second half on offense for the Vikings. Kirk Cousins is due for the odd stinker, but I think he is a upper tier quarterback. Like I think he is consistently disrespecting the NFL, and I'm confident that he's going to turn it around and have some great games. Now this week he's got the Eagles on prime time Thursday night. God. We all know how he does in prime time. We Maybe all know all... He did against the Eagles last year yeah, too. Exactly. Maybe this take will take a couple weeks to sort of <laughs> set in, but I am confident in Kirk Cousins moving forward, steering this Vikings offense in the right direction. Now to the defense side of the ball. In the second half against the Buccaneers, the Bucks had the ball for 20 minutes in the second half. 20 minutes. Remind me how long quarters are in the NFL. Again. 15 minutes. <laughs> That's insane. That is absolutely way too much. So the Vikings had the ball for 10 minutes for 10 in minutes. the second yeah. half. 10 minutes. That's, that's Sometimes that's a drive. If a team really is yeah. going to... You know, drain the clock. Sometimes that's a drive. That's crazy. And of course, there is some blame on the offense for that. Absolutely. But the defense is a shell of itself, I think. That is my main concern with the Vikings. It's it's the defense because I don't think they really have any great talent anywhere to push it forward and to put the offense in great positions. So yeah, to back up your point, uh, Baker Mayfield dropped back like 38 times. The Vikings blitzed them, I think, 21 times. That's Brian still, Flores football. And still only had like nine pressures. Yeah. So oh, so they know that they have a problem rushing the passer. They're loading the box. They're blitzing. And they still can't get any pressure on Baker Mayfield. Which we know, if you get pressure on Baker, you're going to be having a good day. Letting Zadarius Smith go, or he wanted to leave from another team again, whatever the situation is, is actually a big deal. We know they have Daniel Hunter, but like you need someone on the other side who's going to generate that pass rush. And we talk about teams that we're not worried about, like the Steelers, they have those guys. The Vikings don't have that guy. And even like Harrison Smith, who we view as one of the uh, a good safety, he's yeah, getting older. He's getting older. For me, it's all about the trenches with the Vikings. Like the offensive line, too, is not good. You watch quarterback, Kirk Cousins is getting up after every snap with like the bruised ribs, <laughs> the guy can't breathe. It's like, okay. Every week, the his... his Cairo or his acupuncture, yeah. whatever he was doing that at the I feel like the last episode too, the last one it was like yeah this injury it's been here all season or something like that like that that's just getting beat up it's already back probably probably he probably already can't breathe and it's like so what are we gonna do to address this we're not gonna draft anybody we're not gonna sign any external free agents we're just gonna bring Bradbury back for another three years they run for 2.43 yards per carry that's not gonna get it done what are you supposed to do so, especially with Jefferson as this weapon, you got to run the ball better than that. I, I tend to agree with both of you that the offense will be better, for sure. And they'll put up games where they have 30-plus points and they're kind of carrying the team like they did last year. The one area of concern on offense for me, though, is, and you mentioned it, like sometimes turnovers are going to happen, whatever. I think they got really lucky last year in a lot of those games. Yeah. And their record would have looked a lot worse had it not been for some miracle comebacks, some miracle plays, and quite frankly, some luck. And so this year, the concern with me is like, that offense can be still really good, I think. And I think Kirk Cousins, he definitely does get some disrespect. Like I, after watching quarterback, I'm in on Kirk Cousins. Like I like him. <laughs> I think he's a lot better than people give him credit for, for sure. And I think Kevin O'Connell is a really good coach. And I think that they can scheme up a lot of good things with Justin Jefferson and KJ Osborne. And Addison looked really good for his first game. Hawkinson has been a revelation since he got there. So, like, I'm not as concerned about the offense, but I'm more I'm just concerned about the fact that they are going to have some of these games where last year, like, this Tampa Bay game was a win. They yeah. found a way to win this game, whether it be luck, whether it be um, a miracle comeback, whatever. Like, this was a game they won. And this year, I think there are going to be more of these games against some of these bad teams that are closer to them than what the perception of they what the perception of what they were last year, if that makes sense. Like, 
everyone is thinking the Vikings are this amazing team because they're winning these close games, but I think in reality they were probably closer to this Bucks team. Yeah. But they just got lucky in some of those games. And yes, you have to win them. That's fine. But that's the worry for me is like this is all going to kind of come crashing down in this house of cards that is regression for them. I mean, they already have more one score one score game losses this year than, than they, they did, did last, last year. year which that, is that's crazy. all you need like to know week about one, it. Yeah. yeah. So were they overachievers last year? I think so. I for mean, sure. I think... If anything, their playoff loss to the New York Giants, who we just put on blast for 10 minutes. <laughs> no, but that, that was that was the proof of that. There you go. That's the proof so, of concept. Yeah, I think they were due for regression already. Um, long term, the defense were all, I think, in agreement that it's not uh, something to be optimistic about. So if I were to give a number here in terms of worry, um, I think I would go at, at about a five. Is, is that too low? I, I was going to go seven. seven. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. I think, too, when you look at the NFC, we all know it's it's weak, but it's not like there's a bunch of terrible teams. It's more like there's a bunch of average yeah, for sure. teams. So it's not they don't have a cakewalk schedule, mm-hmm. especially with the Lions beating Kansas City. They look pretty good. Yeah. Green Bay Green already Bay has, good. has shown up and like put the Bears on notice that they're still going to lose to the Packers. Um, <laughs> I had to sneak that in there. I, was of course. Say, I had to get that big. Um, but, so they're going to be in some dogfights. And like you said, they already lost that one score game to, to the Bucks. So if that magic does wear off, you know, you even if you go half in one score games, which is to be expected, right? Mm-hmm. The 50-50 approach, then already they're in some trouble. I'm just not sure how far Cousins and Jefferson can, can carry this unit. That's really the question, is how far they can yeah. carry this team because there's nothing that really gets me excited about the Vikings other than those two. And so we'll see how far they can take them. Last team, Seattle Seahawks. I don't think anyone expected them to get destroyed at home by the Rams. I don't think anyone knew what to expect from the Rams, though, to be quite fair. But the telling number is, what did they have, 12 total yards in the second half of that game? It was a close game at one point, and then it's almost (laughs) like you blinked your eyes and it's 30 to 14 for the Rams. You're like, what's going on in Seattle? Nuts. It was nuts. And the worry here, from my perspective... The defense was never going to be the unit that carried them. Like, they had pieces for sure, but that was never going to be the strength of this team. Everyone, I think, was excited about what they could do in year two with Geno Smith. To see what he did in that game against a Rams defense that has Aaron Donald and a bunch of nobody young guys that are still kind of proving themselves in this league and could turn out to be good players was shocking. That offense needs to be better, but I think the worry comes from we saw one year of Geno Smith, and I think a lot of people were quick to crown him. I think we saw maybe three quarters of a season of good Geno Smith, and then the back half of the season, a different Geno Smith that may be more true to what he actually is. I'm not sure, though. Kenneth Walker's an interesting player when you talk about running backs. He's boomer bust with his runs. His efficiency in the running game is not very good. So you're relying on a boomer bust run game, with two second-year tackles still that, again, played really well last year, but things change so quickly in the NFL. Like, it is not easy. I think the hardest thing in the NFL is consistency, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for especially rookies, second-year guys, to have such a good rookie season and then come in the second year and be like, okay, we're going to elevate our game to another level now because we have to because that's what the NFL is all about or else you take a step back. And if those guys take a step back, what does that mean for the offense? If Kenneth Walker takes a step back, what does that mean for the offense? I don't know. I'm, I'm a little worried. <laughs> and those tackles too, they got banged up in that second half. And that's when it really kind of fell apart for Gino. It's like, okay, without those guys, their offensive line depth is clearly not up to par. So if anyone gets hurt up there, it's basically game over. So Geno Smith was just getting attacked all day. And then you look at the other side of the football, Matthew Stafford is just hanging back. Dice. Chilling, throwing to guys who we haven't even heard of before. Nakua to the fifth round. Puka. At, well, it's yeah. like, no Cooper Cup. You don't expect Stafford to be just dicing up a defense. And again, at the end of the day, it's about not getting enough pass rush. I know you said in Wosu, but again, outside of that, it's yeah, young guys. Right. It's a fr- like Boye Mafe and, and guys like that who are going to take time to develop. And... As long as they're not getting pressure, again, guys like Stafford are going to be just carving them up. So for me, it's more about the defense than the offense. Yeah. And like, I still trust Geno with DK, with Lockett, with JSN. It's it, it, there's too much there to be a bad offense. But you need this defense to come up with some stops, and they just did not come up with any key situational things to get Seattle back into this game. 
in our hot takes video, my hot take was, if you guys remember, <laughs> that the Seahawks were going to win the NFC West and have a top three offense this year. Ooh. Now, I don't, I don't mean to be the one who's like not willing to let go or, you know, just being so difficult with my take. Um, but I think if this is the one team that we discussed today, all the points you guys just raised... I, I think I can eventually come around and agree on. Like, Geno Smith had six or seven years of backup-level quarterback play and, you know, labeled as a bust. And then last year, burst onto the scene out of nowhere. Maybe he was just this flash of the pen. I, I totally get that thinking. I think this is the one team I'm just going to pause on for now, though, and just want to see a little bit more. I don't know. Yeah, a, a home loss to a Rams team, they might be kicking themselves bad over that. But I think it's a long season, and I, I I do believe in Gino. I don't know I don't know why. I just I think last year was not just going to be one off season where we look back ten years from now and say remember that guy Gino Smith when he had that one year where he was like a Pro Bowl level level quarterback and he got forty million dollars. <laughs> I kind of do believe in this team long term and Pete Carroll's a good coach, but all those things you guys said can still remain true in that because I can easily see myself four weeks from now saying, yeah, you know what? The Seahawks were overachievers last year. I, I tend to agree with you about the offense and like feeling good about them still, or this being the team that I want to pause on. Out of all the ones we talked about. Out of all the ones we talked about, they're the team I feel the least strong about worrying about this early in the year because I feel like body of work wise and talent wise, I trust what they're doing more so than the other teams that we talked about. And the Bills and Jets are different conversations. So yeah. this is more maybe yeah. the as Vikings, far as the Giants. Vikings, yeah. the Giants, the Seahawks go. Which are all teams that going into the year were probably in the same tier. Exactly. Yeah. And those kind of they're gonna be fighting for a wild card spot yes. this year. Or at least that's what you think. So out of those three, the Seahawks are the one I'm the least worried about as far as turning this around, making it to the playoffs. If I had to pick one of those three teams to make the playoffs, I'd pick the Seahawks. I think I I'm still so. I'm still in on them. The Geno thing, I'm not as high on him, and maybe that's a mistake. This year, I'm I'm just interested because the expectations have changed now. They have. You got paid. Changed. Yeah. You're the guy now. So this is what you wanted. This is what you played for. Obviously, and we're all happy for Geno Smith. Like the story is amazing. I'm really happy to see him succeed after all these years. But with success comes these expectations now, and now you're not sneaking up on anyone. Now people are writing back to you, and you got to be ready <laughs> for that. And so, it's not that I think he's a bad quarterback. I just think that maybe. He is more so in between the guy we saw at the beginning of the year, the guy we saw on Sunday in week one. He's not the highest of highs. He's not the lowest of lows as we saw on Sunday. He's somewhere in between, and I don't know if that's good enough to lead this team to the playoffs. And at least we saw a decent half from the Seahawks, whereas yeah. the Giants, we got, <laughs> we got nothing. We, got nothing. we, we got don't nothing. have anything to go on. And I think it's also worth noting that, like, Week one stinkers are, are nothing new in the NFL. Absolutely. Right? We see teams get absolutely dismantled and still go on to make the playoffs and go on these crazy runs. So for me, I'm with you. The Seahawks are still a playoff team, especially over Minnesota and especially over New York, who just did not show up on no. Sunday. And against a division rival, you expect at least something. And that's coming from, from me, who we've gotten destroyed by the Minnesota Vikings on week one before. Yep. Yeah, and last it, year. It, it, it happens. You, you come back, you put together a, an okay season, yeah. but it's it's just... There, there are glaring holes that get pinpointed. Sometimes it's a good thing in week one for a team to get destroyed, and you're like, okay, wake up call, yeah. let's get it back together. We obviously got to improve on our pass rush or blocking, whatever. It can be a good thing. I think that's honestly the perfect note to end on because you said week one is the biggest overreactionary week because we wait all off season, we're so excited, and then we just take just one small sample size and, and we run with it. Mm -hmm. um, two years that stick out, the Jaguars winning their first game of the season <laughs> and then losing, I think it was only 16 games at the time, losing 15 straight and going out and get Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. Um, the Packers losing week one to the Saints. I think Rodgers threw four interceptions. Um, and then he went on to win MVP that year. So we can very well look back at these takes Five months from now and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe we were panicking about the New York Giants uh, because <laughs> Daniel Jones is now holding the MVP trophy in his hand. That's not going to happen. Um, but I think the point we're all trying to make is that it is just week one. These are overreactions. Some of it is going to be true. Some of it will age poorly. But that's why we love talking football at the end of the day. I agree. And like you said, week one is, is one of those times too where 
everyone's got their takes coming in. So you, you want to see if those takes hold up. And if they don't, then it's the complete opposite where it's like, why didn't that hold up? What are the reasons? We want the immediacy and the answers. We're not going to get that after one week. And we know that here as well. So we're going to have a long season of watching football to go before we see if our worries come true or if we worried for no reason at all, which can be the case sometimes. But either way, let us know what teams you're worried about in the comments and what you want to see us talk about next.